Hey, welcome to a new episode of the Reader Lounge podcast. In this episode, I bring Nick from Book Thinkers into an interview in which we talk about his journey, about book thinkers, and about how he reads books. I hope you enjoyed this episode in which you'll receive a lot of value. Hi, Nick. Welcome to this episode. And thanks for accepting my invitation for you to be on our podcast. So I would like you to first introduce yourself to the audience for those who don't know you yet. Sure. My name is Nick and I run the Book Thinkers social community on Instagram. Uh, Book Thinkers has been around for about four years now and we've been on Instagram for about two and a half or three years. And so we run a big nonfiction book community where people from all over the world get to talk about personal development books and books that can help improve their lives. And so for the last few years, I've been reading hundreds and hundreds of these books and implementing these lessons into my lives. And I also am the host of the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books podcast, where I interview a lot of these authors as well. Great. So uh, I would like to start talking more about Book Thinkers. So what were the origins of it? Book Thinkers started... Uh, towards the end of my college career because when I was attending classes I wasn't getting a lot of value out of those classes and an early mentor of mine uh, he recommended a couple books and one of them was Rich Dad Poor Dad and I realized that I could condense decades of information into days of learning and that was really exciting for me at the time because like I said I was sort of bored in my classes And I started to read so much and I, it started to change my life in such a positive way. I wanted to share that information with the world. And so that's sort of how Book Thinkers started. I was meeting with one of my friends each and every week and we called it a mastermind group because in Rich Dad, I mean, in uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he talks about how one plus one can really equal three. It creates a third mind when two people are aligned and holding each other accountable for good goals. And uh, that's how Book Thinkers started. You know, we, we just wanted to share this information with the world that we were learning. Great. And was that uh, concept from Think and Grow Rich the, like, the motivation for the name of Book Thinkers? Well, the name Book Thinkers, uh, when we had this idea, we didn't have a name. And so we thought, okay, well, how do we find a good name for the business? And so we started coming up with a bunch of different options, but all of the websites were taken, the domain names. And so we, one day I was sitting in an office, you know, for my full-time job and it was after work hours, it was at night and we were just sitting around talking and it was me with the same coworker that recommended the books in the first place. And we were just on godaddy.com, which is where you can buy a domain name. We were just searching different names. And then he called me over and he said, Hey, I found one. It's called bookthinkers.com. It's available. All the social medias are available, like nobody's ever used this word before. And so I ran back over to my computer and I bought it instantly. And uh, so that's how it originally happened. I, I knew that I wanted something that was unique and I knew I wanted something where I could buy the website domain immediately. And so that's how it happened. And how were like the first stages of Book Thinkers? Was it more difficult than what you have expected? Well, yeah. I mean, it was very intimidating. I mean, to start a real business, especially in the United States, you need to jump through a lot of hoops. And so you need to legally register your business in a state. And so we legally registered our business in the state of Massachusetts. And then we needed to set up an accounting package because all of a sudden we would have uh, money coming in and expenses going out. And we needed to keep track of that because if you don't keep track of that, you can get in trouble. And then we needed to buy the domain names and start all of the social media pages. And then we really needed to decide like, okay, who owns what percentage of the business? And then you need to legally document all of that. And so there were a lot of steps in the very beginning behind the scenes just to set a good foundation to make sure that if Book Thinkers was ever going to grow, that we weren't going to look back and think like, wow, we really messed up at the beginning. And so I read a couple books on like taxes and business formation and how to do it. And then we executed on all of that. Um, but then starting on social media was very difficult as well, because when you start as you, as you're used to, when you start, you have zero followers, nobody knows who you are, or what you're doing, and you need to find that community 
you need to get into it. You need to start posting and generating fans. And that's a very slow process for a lot of people. It took me a very, very long time before anybody noticed what I was doing. And so that that's, you know, there's the business side, which took a long time, but then there's the social side, which also took a long time, but it's more painful because you're producing so much content and you have big expectations for the world to see it. When you legally register your business, you don't care if anybody sees that because there's no audience that's expected. Uh, but on social media, there, you know, it's a little bit different. Yeah, and it's difficult, right, in the beginning because you would expect to, well, be doing great since the first day, but you don't. And uh, I would like to know if there was like any book that, any specific book that helped you with this process or maybe some books and not, not just only one. Well, uh, I, I think that I found the motivation uh, by reading a lot of biographies. And so at that time, I was reading books like Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. And I was learning about the early stages of Apple. And just a funny story, I mean, when there were only three people at Apple, Steve Jobs, uh, Wozniak, and then there was this third guy, you know, Wozniak and Jobs, they didn't want to get involved in legally registering the business or setting it up or dividing anything up. So they just gave that responsibility to somebody else. And I think they split it by three, but then that guy got overwhelmed and he gave all of it back to Jobs and Wozniak. And it's like, you know, right now that would be worth $500 billion, you know? And so it's just, it, I was learning about how informal the process really was because we get intimidated by tax laws and all of the legal hoops that you need to jump through, but it can be a little bit more relaxed than that. And so Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson, that was a really good book. And then also Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. That was a good book because again, it was just somebody who was really passionate about something and it was a long, fun process. You know, you're learning as you go. You don't need to have it all figured out up front. And, uh, you know, by understanding the process that those two went through, yeah, it was a big motivation for me and it helped me sort of guide everything. And then as far as the actual books on tax strategy and law and business classification, those were all little short, like 50 to 100 page books that I bought on Amazon. And I just looked at the highest rated ones in each category and bought them. Great, and so you mentioned motivation. And I would like to know about the motivation for book thinkers and for yourself. Did you get your motivation from books or did you already had something that motivated you? Well, I had never read a single book until I was about 21 years old. So Emiliano, you're 15, you're way ahead of where I was. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I was... I was recommended to read these books because I wasn't satisfied or motivated elsewhere in my life. You know, I was operating from a place of ego and insecurity and it wasn't a very clean lifestyle. I wasn't, you know, I was happy and having fun, but I wasn't always happy and having fun. And so, and I wasn't fulfilled. Like it was all temporary short-term gratification. And so these books changed my life and It's not like I went into book thinkers with this love of books. Like the love of books was generated from consistently reading and then the passion came from the consistency. And so I think today, you know, especially on social media, everybody says align your existing passion with a business idea and you'll be happy. But that's not always the case. Everybody doesn't always have an existing passion. I mean, at the time, you know, and I know you can't relate to this, but a lot of people might be able to. At the time, like, what were my passions? I was having fun. I was going out. I was drinking. I was partying. You know, I was going to the gym a lot. I was playing basketball. Like, those passions weren't going to lead to a profit. And so I needed to develop a new passion. And that passion came from identifying an opportunity to improve my life. You know, going through the tough times of reading. Like, at first, it was not very easy for me to sit down and read these books. You know, I was against it. I actually had a, had a stance against reading. And then, but through the consistency and through all the hard work and the discipline and the routines and setting it up and the time blocking, like I read a bunch of books and I thought, wow, this really changed my life. And so that's where the motivation came from. It was from just consistently reading and then 
you know, the going back to Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, you know, each and every week during that mastermind group that I was meeting with, it was really just me and one of my friends. We would just each and every week, we would identify the things that weren't going well in our lives in areas for opportunity and improvement. And so like, if I didn't like doing my laundry that week, I'd write down, I don't like laundry. I wish it was a faster process or something. And then we would talk about those ideas. And so for me, when I first started reading books, like I had a lot of people asking me, Hey, what are the best books for this? What are the best books for that? And I didn't have anything but my personal social media. And so each time I had to type up a recommendation and talk with people and like, I thought I needed to automate that process. And so that was like the early motivation was, you know, it was slow for me to recommend books to other people. And you said about that you, well, you said that you did masterminds, right? With your friends. So was this like the early stages of how you applied books and how you implemented the concepts on them? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and uh, it was pretty informal, but like that was a really solid example and representation of implementing something from a book. You know, going back to that idea, I was fascinated by the fact that one plus one could equal three. Like I, I, I understood the concept of it, but I wanted to apply it. And so we met every single week. And in the room that we were meeting, we had whiteboards. And so we would just sketch things out on the whiteboards and connect the dots. And, you know, we started to understand that two people motivated being pushed in the same direction is so much more powerful than two individual people motivated working in the same direction. Like the collaboration and the ideas and the adjacent possible that you realize each step of the ladder, like that is real and it's hard to quantify and define, but like that's how book thinkers definitely started. So yeah, that was a representation of, of implementing a lesson from that book. Great. And for example, you say that, uh, two people motivated, I uh, create, uh, things that wouldn't be possible with just one person. You also mentioned a lot about your, who your purpose, which is, uh, progress. So, I would like to know more about how did you discover that progress is your purpose in life? Well, I read Evan Carmichael's book, Built to Serve. And when I was reading that book, there are a ton of exercises. And so he'll have you answer dozens of questions about your life. And then sort of with your answers, he helps you boil them down into one word. And then over time, you start to realize like, what is one word that defines why you're fulfilled at the end of the day. And for me, it's progress. I realized that if I'm making positive forward momentum progress in my health, in my wealth, and in my love, like communication with friends, family, and relationships, if I'm improving those things, then I feel fulfilled and happy at the end of the night. And that's in my life, but then in other people's lives, I'm also really fulfilled when I help them make progress. And books are such a fantastic mechanism for that because, you know, every single time somebody writes a book, they've made progress in their lives in a positive way and they're trying to make a positive dent or impact on the world. And so they're sharing those lessons for you to implement. And so I've read such a diverse, you know, uh, group of information, so many different genres and, and so many different things that I've tried to implement in my life that when somebody comes to me and they have a problem, oftentimes if they want, I'll make a recommendation and it's based on a book. It's not my personal experience or opinion all the time. It's like, you know, Hey, I, James clear who wrote atomic habits says, this is what you should do to optimize your morning routine. And so people really like that information. So anyway, progress is my who, you know, and my why is because I went through that experience and that transformation. I went from ego and insecurity to confidence, you know, and, and stability and all these great characteristics. And it happened because of books. And then my how, like how am I delivering that? Right now it's through book thinkers uh, or personal recommendations or conversations or podcasts or whatever the case is. And uh, yeah, so it took a long time. I mean, I only defined my who as progress this year, but now that I've defined it, it's so easy to communicate it to other people. Whereas before, I would talk about the mission of book thinkers or certain things that happened in my life. And it was always a different answer, but now it's always progress. And what advice would you give to anyone trying to find their why, their who, and their how? I would read Built to Serve. 
by Evan Carmichael. <laughs> or if you can't afford the book or can't get access to it, I would start to follow him on Instagram. He has a lot of great, lot of great feedback and, and content and educational stuff. And on YouTube, he has a couple million subscribers and he posts fantastic content. So that's his main platform. So check out his content, you know, and then do the exercises. A lot of people read books and the author will say, hey, you know, go to this website and do this, rec this exercise or, hey, answer this question before you move on. And a lot of people just skip right over those things. But if you want to get the most out of the book and implement, then do the exercises. And uh, that, I mean, that book changed my life in a big way because it's so simple now. Like I know if I want to be happy, I just need to make progress in those areas and then I'm happy. And now that you know more about your personal purpose, uh, what do you plan for your future and for the future of Book Thinkers? Well, with Book Thinkers, uh, you know, our mission statement is empowering readers to achieve more and live better. And right now we're doing that in a couple different ways. We have the social media, uh, which is the most popular. We're doing over a million impressions a week. And we have about 90,000 people on the main community. We have the podcast and each and every week I'm introducing the audience and people to new authors, new books and new resources that they can use to achieve more and live better. And then we have our new mobile application, which leverages optimized organization and spaced repetition to help people retain and implement more from the books they love. And so as Book Thinkers continues to grow, we'll continue to identify opportunities to empower readers to achieve more and live better. And if it's a a good fit for the business, then we'll keep growing that community. Like we, at the core of that, that mission statement is our vision, which is we know self-education is a powerful tool. We know that it helps level the playing field. You don't need to, uh, you know, pay 500,000 US dollars to go to Harvard. You can just pick up a couple good books and learn those takeaways. And everybody has access to those books, no matter where you are in the world. And that's a really powerful kind of like vision to be aligned with is, you know, co to continue to give people access to these tools. Like Instagram's free. I do, I do book summaries and tips. You can go implement these things I'm talking about. And then, I mean, for me, my, I'm motivated by a couple things. Um, one, you know, not in a materialistic sense, but it's financial stability and insecurity. I mean, insecurity uh, and location independence. Like I, I never, you know, and I don't feel this now, but I don't feel the stress of money when I wake up and that's a beautiful feeling. And I'd love for my friends and family also to be able to experience that. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk says the person that's winning is the person that wakes up in the morning and doesn't feel any, you know, any stress or anxiety. And so for me, I just want to make sure that I can keep that feeling for the rest of my life, but also have my friends and family get to experience it from my hard work too. Um, and just keep, you know, keep making progress in my life, in my life and keep helping, you know, keep helping other people make progress too. And is, I would like to know if that's your definition of success, like waking up in the morning and knowing you did a great last day and you can progress today. Is that like your definition or do you consider yourself successful? Because I do. <laughs> I do yeah. consider your yeah, I, I think that is a good, I, I don't have, you know, I should probably read a book like Built to Serve, but on def, on defining success, because I don't have one definition for success. I guess daily progress for me is success. It is happiness. It is fulfillment. And there's always room to improve areas of our lives that will never change. And so I'm much more focused on identity than I am outcome. And so for me, my identity as somebody who makes progress, like I love the process, not the outcome. And so for me, I think I'll be happy forever as long as I can continue to be, you know, continue to make progress and help the world in a positive way. So yeah, that's a good definition of, of success for me. And uh, I do think that as long as I'm making progress, I'll be happy. I really believe that, you know, and for somebody else, that's <clears throat> as long as they can go for a run, they're going to be happy. Or as long as they can, you know, donate a meal to a homeless person, they're going to be happy. Like everybody's definition is a little bit different, but I love identity based happiness instead of outcome based happiness. Because if your idea is okay, a million dollars, I'll be happy. And then you make a million dollars. And now what 
you're unfulfilled and you're without a purpose. So make sure it's focused on your identity and process and not an outcome. Yeah, I agree with this. And I would like you to like advise your 15 year old self. If you saw him once again, or well, you're 26, right? So you're a 16 year old self. What advice would you give him to progress in life in general or in his point in his life? I feel like I'm already talking to my 15, 16 year old <laughs> self right now. I would, uh, you know, there, there's a few things I would do. I, num number one, the number one recommendation, and you hear it all the time, but I would really, I would say this every single day to my 15 or 16 year old self is don't care that much about what other people think of you. You know, I spent a lot of time caring too much and that caused insecurities and anxieties and it caused me to be all, you know, there's two sides of caring too much. There's, you know, you fear judgment, but you also take praise into your head. And so that causes ego. And I dealt with both sides of that a lot. And so I was insecure and I cared too much about what other people thought, but I also developed an ego because people would compliment me and people would tell me that I was doing great. I would let that go to my head. And um, so I would just stop caring what other people thought and I would spend more time reflecting on what makes me happy, not what makes other people less judgmental or to continue to give me praise. And that would, you know, that would have changed a lot of the decisions that I would have made. And like right now, I'm very happy with where I am. And to answer your question before, I do consider myself successful just because I'm happy seven days a week, really happy and fulfilled. But I think I could have become happier and more fulfilled back when I was 15 or 16 if I just stopped caring what other people thought. So that's a big lesson. You know, and the other one obviously is to read more books, to start adding additional perspective. You know, when you grow up and you're isolated and you only care about what you think or what other people think in your immediate circle, you have a very small view of the world. But when you start to read authors from all over the world and you start to add in perspectives that maybe you didn't have before you can mature yourself a lot faster and so these concepts that i'm talking about by the way like when i was 15 or 16 i might not have been able to understand them very well so there might have been like a different way that i would deliver that but you're a smart guy and you understand what i'm talking about which is really cool um and probably you know the last thing is patience you know, I've lived an entire lifetime in the last 10 years. And if I was to die today, which sounds a little bit morbid, I'd be happy because I've really lived my life to the fullest and I've had a vast, wide variety of different experiences. I've traveled all over the world. I've started a business. I've made a lot of money. I have a fantastic relationship with my girlfriend. You know, I've had pets. I've, you know, bought a really cool car. Like I've done so much in the last 10 years. And I think that I have the rest of my life too. And so just be patient, you know, but live life today, which is counterintuitive. Gary Vee talks about sort of the sky and the dirt, I think is what he says. Like make sure the macro vision is patience and, and hustle, but then on the day to day, like really focus on living your life and being happy. And so I've, I think I've balanced those two really well for the last couple of years but I'll tell you from 15 or 16 through 21, I didn't balance it very well. So I, I wasted 50% of that time. And I can only imagine, you know, I can only imagine if, if I had doubled the, the feeling of happiness and security instead of just only half of the time. Yeah. And now that you mentioned that uh, concept or that idea from Gary Vee, I yesterday saw your video with Grant Cardone. And he talks about like improving and thinking about your future in 10x, right? Or I didn't hear the complete uh, mm -hmm. podcast, but it's something like that, right? How do you uh, manage to grow uh, with that speed and also to to leave the moment? Because I got a bit confused with the message uh, Grant gave. Yeah, you know, Grant, Grant says that his biggest regret in life is not setting big enough goals. And the 10x mindset is about elevating yourself to a new playing field, to a new game. You know, not to be worried about the day-to-day -day stuff and let it cause you anxiety and to be playing a bigger game. But also, you know, for me, it, it sounds contradictory, but I think that, you know, on a daily basis, discipline equals freedom. 
if you're controlling your time, if you're always in the present moment, then you do feel alive and you do feel free. And the, you know, the interesting thing about setting really big goals and moving really fast, but also staying present is that the 80, 20 principle, like only 20% of your daily activity leads to 80% of the result. And so I call that high impact activity. Whereas the 80% of low impact activity that only leads to 20% of the results, you can get rid of that. And so by getting rid of that, right, and maybe you double your impact activity. So you're only working 40% of what you were working before, but now you've doubled um, sort of the outcome. And so that's, that's where I'm sitting today is I only focus on high impact activity and I free up a lot of time by getting rid of the low impact activity by automating, delegating, and eliminating that low impact activity. And so the business is moving faster. The business is growing. We're always focused on high impact activity, but I also have a lot of time in my day to slow things down and to practice gratefulness. And I know that I'm not outcome based. I don't need to sell book thinkers for 50 million tomorrow to be happy. I just need to make a little bit of progress and then I'm happy. And so it's like, I don't know the numbers or the math to support like the ideal situation, but I know right now it's working really well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or is that a crazy thought? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it does make sense. And you mentioned the uh, DEAL concept, right? From the four hour work week. So do you use like that specific book to get rid of the 80% stuff that doesn't create a big impact in your life or do you use other methods? Well, that book helped introduce the concept to me, you know, and then I read the 80-20 principle by Richard Cook and I read some other books that talk about the 80-20 principle. So once it was really, really, really formulated in my mind, I think the book that helped me execute the most against it was Essentialism by Greg McEwen. And so in Essentialism by Greg McEwen, he basically says each and every month define sort of like six, seven, or eight big things that you want to hit. And then you need to prioritize them. So each and every day when you sit down, you start at the top of the list and you work against that activity. And once you've made progress on that, if you go to sleep and you've just made progress on that first activity, since it's the most important, then you're going to be happy you've made progress, you're executing against your big 10x goal. And then once you're done with that one, you can move down the list, down the list, down the list. Now, if something, a wild opportunity pops up out of nowhere, which happens all the time with book thinkers, a new author wants to work with me or a new book just came out or I need to you know, enter this new business unit, which all of a sudden makes a ton of sense. Like, Unless it's better than what I already have in my list, I need to table that and add it to my list of other things to consider for next month. And so for me, that always keeps me focused on the high impact activity. Each and every day I'm prioritizing the high impact activity. I'm not letting the distractions attack me. You know, and then I think delegation as, as part of that Tim Ferriss structure has been the most important for me because once you can identify what's high impact and what's low impact, there's a lot of low impact stuff that still needs to get done day to day. And so you can automate a lot of that with software and technology. You can eliminate some stuff that you might not realize, you know, that you might realize isn't that important, but then delegating the low impact activity that still needs to get done. I learned how to do that through the E-Myth revisited by Michael E. Gerber and Book Thinkers has uh, a group of subcontractors that works for the business each and every day to take care of some of that low impact activity. And yeah, that, you know, those books, the four hour work week, the 80, 20 principle, um, the myth revisited and essentialism. Like what a, what a good group of four books to, <laughs> to help free up some time. And I would love to know, uh, when are you planning to write your book? Because it would be amazing to read it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, by the end of the year, I do have a big goal to finish a book proposal. And the first book that I'm going to write, I think it's going to be titled, You Have an Upgrade Available. And it'll be, 
an introduction to personal development, it'll be 15 alter egos or 15 areas to improve in your life. And these will all be 1% changes that as they compound over 15 years, they'll lead to big differences in your life. And so an example of an alter ego is like the monk. You know, there's two versions of you. There's the version of you that never adopts any meditation or mindfulness practice into your weekly routine. And then there's the version of you that does, and I'll call that the monk. And so I'll talk about my experience with meditation and mindfulness. I'll talk about the books and resources that I use to help achieve some progress in that, in that area. I'll talk about, you know, the desired lifestyle changes that that will lead to 15 years into the future. And uh, I'll introduce people to 15 of those because the most common thing that I'm getting in my DMs nowadays is like, I'm brand new to this. I read a couple books. They excited me. Like, what's next? And so I'd love to, to, to serve up that book on a platter. In the intro, you can read about these 15 alter egos and see which ones interest you. Maybe some of what the desired lifestyle changes are. And uh, that might be the first book. That's what's in my head right now. And so if the book proposal is done this year, it could get published next year, maybe 2022. Depends on if it ever falls into my essentialism activities for the month. <laughs> it sounds great. I would love to read it. <laughs> Thank and you. well, you mentioned also about personal development and for people new to this world, right? So for these people who maybe pass through these uh, personal development cycles when they might feel like great one day, but uh, 10 days later, they might feel unmotivated or like they are not progressing a lot. What advice would you give to them? Or do you ever uh, pass through these cycles? Not anymore, uh, but I definitely did at the beginning. You know, with, with reading specifically, I always recommend that people start small and they create positive momentum. You know, every time you pick up a book when you've never read books before, it takes a lot of willpower. And so each and every time, you know, you're trying to find time in your schedule, you're really forcing yourself to read. You might not love the process. You might get tired after a couple minutes. So start really small, five minutes a day, on a book that aligns with either a skill set that you've defined that you want to get better at, or maybe it aligns with a person that you want to be like, like with you in the Elon Musk book. And so start small five minutes a day and create momentum and see what happens with momentum is that you'll start to form a habit. So your subconscious will identify opportunities for you to read. And you know, you'll start to convince yourself through positive self-talk that this is a good thing. And that'll decrease the willpower necessary to pick up the book. And so five minutes a day is really achievable, you know, stack it into a morning routine or a time of day that you really want to, you know, that, that is easy for you to make it really simple and um, measure your progress, you know, start to talk to people about it, get motivated, identify as a reader, tell other people that you're a reader. Jim Quick says that the two most powerful words in the English language are I am. And so start telling yourself that I am a reader, you know, um, make the environment around you friendly for reading, leave books everywhere, and then you're more likely to read. And so there's so many little tips and tricks to help generate momentum. And then when, once you really get a lot of momentum and you see a clear return on investment, you'll, you know, there's no reason not to be reading. And so for me, like I've just found that over time, it's continued to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's not about motivation or discipline all the time it's about momentum in my opinion and now and, uh, about um reading so um, in my first year of reading i read like 14 books maybe well no in the first semester i read because it was august i read elon musk so within six months one 400 long page this book and then i read 15 i think this year i'll read 25 so I would like you to talk about your like your path of, of reading and how have you improved? Uh, how much do you read now and how do you take notes? Well, when I first started reading, I, I started about halfway through the year, I think. And so I probably read, you know, a similar amount, maybe 15 books in my first year. I wish I, I was documenting better back in the day so that I had real numbers to give you, but I probably read about 15 books. And then maybe it jumped up to 30 in the next year. And then for the last few years, you know, it's been anywhere between 15 and 80 books. And 
walking into 2020, so at the end of 2019, last year I, I think I read 75. And so this year I said, I want to slow it down a little bit and revisit some of my favorite books. The 20% that have led to 80% of the positive changes in my life. And so I wrote down those 30 books that I wanted to reread. And then I decided I'd like to read 30 new books. And those would be a combination of books that recommendations from friends, new books that came out that I had to read that the social community validated uh, or paid book promotions because I was doing a lot of those in the beginning of 2020. And, you know, now I'm on pace to probably read 80 or 90 books this year. So I'm going, I'm definitely going to overachieve that goal. But uh, that's because I launched the podcast. I'm doing one podcast episode per week, uh, sometimes a little, a little bit more, and that requires a lot of reading. But rereading those books that have had the biggest impact on my life, I've loved doing that. So that's a little bit about my reading journey. And I think, you know, if I sold Book Thinkers for $50 million tomorrow, I would still be reading that much. Like that's how much momentum I have. It's led to such a positive impact on my life outside of business that I don't, I don't see myself stopping for any reason anytime soon. Like the more you, the more you read, the more you, you realize you don't know a lot that's out there. (laughs) And like, you'll go from somebody who's a know-it-all and then you read a couple books and you realize, you know, nothing. And so that's like one fun realization. And the last part of your question was about taking notes. And for the last couple of years, I've always looked for my top 10 takeaways from a book. Because I'm somebody that's, that's reading a lot, and, and I just feel like in order to implement 100 things, you're going to need a lot of time to implement 100 takeaways from a book. And it's very difficult to keep track of implementing 100 different things. So for me, identifying up to my top 10 is sort of my biggest task. And so when I'm reading a book, a physical book, I'm circling page numbers. I'm highlighting things. Like if I really love something, I'll circle the page a lot to kind of like highlight it or I'll put a star next to the section that I really love. And when I'm done reading the book, uh, I'll do, you know, for the last couple of years, I would put my notes into Evernote. Now I put my notes directly into the new Book Thinkers mobile application. And the reason for doing that, you know, the application only allows up to 10 takeaways. You can label your takeaways as an action item or a general note, a quote. Uh, you can custom label it, whatever you want to do. And then the system if for books. Now, then there's two situations once I've read the book, I've taken my notes and I've put them in the system. If it's a book that's not one of those 20% that can lead to 80% of the impact, I just leave my notes in there and I can revisit them whenever I want. If I'm going to walk into a situation where I know I'm negotiating for something, I can pull up my notes of Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss and I can reread my biggest takeaways on negotiation. Now they're fresh in my brain and I can go implement them. So that's a scenario where just having the notes in the app and always accessible, uh, you know, not written in a notebook at home is really valuable. Another situation, though, is for those 20% that lead to 80% of the impact, so my high-impact books, things that are life-changing, uh, or even takeaways that are life-changing, I can turn on my systematic reminders. And so what the application does is it says, okay, up front when that information is fresh, you have a high chance of remembering that information. But if you're not revisiting that information, then over time, the chances that you're going to remember it go down, just like with a name of of somebody that you learned six years ago and then you haven't thought about that person, like the chances you remember their name are pretty low. And so the system will push you notifications to go back and reread your biggest uh, takeaways from those books at a schedule that increases over time. So the intervals get bigger over time, but the more often you review that information, you're strengthening your relationship to that information. You're strengthening your neural pathways and then your subconscious is, is, Uh, has a tighter relationship to that info so you can identify more opportunities to implement it, but you'll also just retain it. So when somebody asks you about your favorite notes, you'll be able to spit them right out, which is really cool. And so just the last piece on that is the app is extending your relationship with the book. Most people read a book, they highlight their biggest takeaways, maybe they write them down and then that's it. You're done. You move on to the next book and you never revisit it. And you can only remember what you're thinking about. So if you're not revisiting it, if you don't extend that relationship for years to come, 
then there's an opportunity cost. You're missing opportunities to take advantage of that information. And so you're not living up to your full potential. And uh, that's how I take notes. You know, that's the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, or may, maybe inside uh, the book theme precept, can you track your progress with the, uh, with the things you can take action from books, like maybe a certain concept? Or I'll put as an example the 5 a.m. club. So Robin Sharma says you wake up at 5 a.m. for 66 days and you then get to automation, right? But this, well, tracking your process of waking up at 5 a.m. is easy because you could just check. But for example, if there's a concept which is more difficult to track maybe like the getting 1% better every day. How would you try that? Yeah, so the, the Book Thinkers app today, it doesn't have the ability for you to track progress against your action items. I use a shared Excel spreadsheet with my friends. So I'm part of an accountability group that meets every single week and we all have a shared Excel spreadsheet um, on the bottom, you know, my name, my friend's name, my other friend's name, my other friend's name. And so we could look at each other's activity through the week. And so that's where I plug in information from the books that I'm, you know, reading that I want to implement or try out. And so a concept from the 5 a.m. club, just using that as an example, if your goal is to hit 66 days in a row, you know, Monday through Sunday, your goal is seven. And then each day you put a little check mark. And so if you don't accomplish the goal, then it highlights it in red at the end of the week in our little spreadsheet because we have conditional formatting set up. And then during the call, we can talk about, okay, why didn't you accomplish this goal? What can you do next week to increase your chances of hitting it? Um, sometimes we multiply the impact on our final completion percentage for the week, like all the goals versus the outcome. Um, so you can make it more valuable and have a higher impact if you miss it. Like there's a lot of different things that I do in that spreadsheet, but that spreadsheet is where I implement things from books. And so you know, it's, it's all measurable. And if you're not measuring something, then it's very difficult to manage the improvement. And so some things are more difficult to measure, like you, like you mentioned, making a 1% improvement in your life or defining progress in general. But for a lot of things like that example, there are a lot of things you can implement out of books that are, that are tangible and measurable like that. And so the spreadsheet is really good for it. Well, your personal relationships seem to be very empowering to each one of you guys. And well, I would like to know how have you built these relationships or which books have helped you? Well, the compound effect by Darren Hardy laid out uh, the idea for this accountability group. And he sort of gives you a mock example of the spreadsheet that you can use to track activity and how to track activity and how to calculate your completion percentage and what sort of numbers to shoot for. And I had read that book with a couple of my friends. I'm, I may have read it first. I can't remember. Uh, but I may have read it with a couple of my friends. And once we had all read the book, we agree, like, we really need to implement this. And they say, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And so at the time, I was sending books left and right and up and down to all of my friends. Like, I wanted to improve my circle, not because I thought I was going to leave people behind, but just that I knew that it could help accelerate my own growth if my friends were really into these concepts too. And so I chose, like, you know, a few of my highly motivated friends, and we started to meet. And, uh, you know, that's how that initially happened. That was the book that helped it happen. And nowadays, you know, I really believe in that concept. If the five people that you spend the most time with are all partying and drinking and going out and spending money and, and unhappy, well, guess what? You're going to be the sixth person that's unhappy and going out and partying and whatever. But if all of the five people you spend the most time with are millionaires, guess what? You're going to become the sixth millionaire. And that concept was really important for me. So I did, you know, I did do some networking on social media and I met some really cool people that I talk with all the time. You know, I searched for mentors from the books that I was reading and I met some really cool people and I talk with them all the time. And then 
also like I, I did join some groups like I did Toastmasters for public speaking and I met some really cool people and it's just putting yourself in situations where like-minded people will you know have the opportunity to talk with you and meet with you and answer your questions and things like that yeah I, so would you suggest people to go like to social media or a networking groups to meet new people and uh, also you said about mentors so what is the definition of a mentor for you because i like three months ago had the idea of well it became a reality but of this mentor that uh is called spencer hoffman he's from here and he says if you want to have a mentor one way to have him or her is to work for people him or her right but then i reflected so is there like another way to have a mentor and do you think that just reading a book could be considered uh to having a mentor like the author i do yeah i think it's the best and easiest and least expensive way to have a mentor uh there's this there's a ted talk where ty lopez the internet marketing guru he he says to the audience like hey If I told you that, oh, he says, like, raise your hand if you would come to dinner tonight at my house, fly all the way to L.A. If, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger was there and he was going to answer all your questions about bodybuilding and Richard Branson was there and he was going to answer all your questions about entrepreneurship and Steve Jobs was there and he was going to answer all your questions about creativity and, you know, he just lists off a couple more icons of industry. And everybody says, I, you know, I would go, I would pay $10,000 for that, whatever. And he says, well, cool, you guys can all come over. And in my library, I have all their books. And in those books, those are the answers to your questions. Because Steve Jobs will teach you about creativity. you know, And Richard Branson will teach you about entrepreneurship. And they will give you frameworks for learning and models that you can apply to your decision making. And to me, when I listened to that, that's when it clicked. Like, books are mentors. And I remember in The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, I might be getting this quote wrong, but he says something like, there's a Jim Rohn quote where he says like, I've spent, oh, shoot, I totally forget the where this came from now. But anyway, it's like, you know, somebody had said like, I spent, you know, 10,000 hours with Jim Rohn, but 99.9% of it was his books and audio tapes and things like that. And so like, I do think that mentors can come in that form. And I do think everybody behind me, uh, Right now we're talking face to face for anybody that's just listening. I've got my bookshelf behind me. I think all of these books behind me represent my mentors. Now that's one way to get mentorship. I think another really important lesson, it comes from The Third Door by Alex Benayan. He's sitting down at this table where all of these other icons of industry in Silicon Valley are sitting around him at breakfast and his mentor at the time, Elliot, says to him, Alex, you need to remember a very simple lesson. You can either be friends with these people or you can be a fan of these people, but you can't be both. So remember, friends shake hands, fans take pictures. So when you meet these people, shake their hand, act like a friend, and then you'll get access to them as a network or a potential mentor. But you can't take pictures and be like a fan because they're just going to turn you off and you're not going to get access to them. And like that conversation clicked for me because now that I have some social influence, And I do have the opportunity to speak with a lot of the authors that sit behind me, whereas before I didn't. I always think about that lesson. If I want them to be my mentor, I need to be a friend, not a fan. And so I apply that a lot. So yeah, th those are a couple thoughts that I have on mentorship. I hadn't thought of the second one, and it is true. <laughs> and well, now I would like to ask you the always question. Um, so the first question is from Books on the Desk, and it says, what are the top five biographies you have ever read? Top five biographies. Well, my favorite biographer is Walter Isaacson. And so we already talked about one of his books, Steve Jobs. I really loved that book. Another book by Walter Isaacson, a biography that he wrote, is Leonardo da Vinci. And that's a fantastic book. It talks all about creativity. And I found Leonardo to be a fascinating human being. 
A third biography by Walter Isaacson that I love is titled Einstein, and it's all about Albert Einstein. And I learned so much in that book uh, about concepts that were foreign to me previously, you know, relativity and all that kind of stuff. And now, you know, I don't apply that to my life all the time, but I find it fascinating and I can have a conversation about it. Uh, Two more that I'll mention, The Everything Store, which is all about Jeff Bezos and Amazon. I think that Amazon is the most powerful company in the world right now. And so it's really important for us to go and learn about the early stages of Amazon and about Jeff Bezos. I mean, he is one of the richest human beings on the planet right now, and he still has enough runway to work for another 20 or 30 years. So he's going to be a household name. We should understand as much as we can about him. And then the last book is one that you mentioned that you loved, which is Elon Musk by Ashley Vance. And that was a really cool book too. You know, I loved learning about Elon in his early days. and He's a good representation of somebody that just, he sheds society's expectations to the side and he just lives his life and he does things the way that he wants to do them. And so I find that fascinating as well. Do you consider these five people your mentors or, well, uh, maybe Isaacson and Be- Bezos and Elon? I, uh, in some parts I do. You know, in that same Ty Lopez TED Talk where he was talking about having the books, he basically says that, you know, these people become tools in a tool belt. So picture like a a real tool belt with a hammer and a drill and like all that kind of stuff. And he says, you know, when you have access to that tool and it's always on your hip, you know, it doesn't mean you're always going to use it. You only use the hammer when you see a nail right? You don't use the hammer when you see another situation that might require a wrench or something like that. And so with these books, like I have access to these models and these decision-making thought processes and things like that whenever I need them, but I don't always have to use them. And so like, yes, Steve Jobs, um, I understand how he operates so well after that book. And I've read it a couple times now that like, if I'm looking at a situation, I can take out his thought process and, and run the situation through it. And like, what would Steve Jobs do? And that same situation, if I don't like that outcome, I could take out my Jeff Bezos and run, run the situation through like, how would Jeff Bezos handle this? Okay, do I like that outcome? No. Now let me look at Elon. And so I can do that because I have all of this and it's documented so well in my app and in my notebooks. And I'm reviewing it so often that it's always at the top of my mind. And like, in some part, those are my mentors, but I think I have, you know, I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of those mentors. So I've got a so lot. So not of, just them, right? Uh, maybe all the 70, 700 authors you have, you have 700 books or how many books do you have? Yeah, well, the number goes up every week. But yeah, <laughs> 700 to 800 is, is, is my guess, although it's been a long time since I've counted. Um, and, you know, I've having read hundreds and hundreds of these, like I've, I definitely have a lot of mentors, you know, and then there are, there are real mentors that I do meet with each and every week or that I have access to when I need to ask them questions. And so one example is Kevin Horsley. He's a, he lives in South Africa. He's a memory grandmaster. And so at one point he memorized the first 10,000 digits of pi and competed in these memory competitions. And he's a really spectacular human. And I meet with Kevin every single week for one hour. And so he's a brilliant person. You know, his book, Unlimited Memory, has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And, you know, he's a bestseller and that kind of stuff. But he's also just a really smart man who's read, you know, tons and tons and tons of, of amazing books. And he's created an ideal life for himself. And, like, he, he consults on book thinkers as a business and also in my personal life. And, like, I love meeting with him each and every week. And having Carmichael, who wrote Built to Serve, I ask him a lot of questions and stuff like that and his advice on certain things. And so it's nice to have access to those people, you know, as, as a more conversational mentor rather than just an observational mentor. Yes, looks right. Well, mm-hmm. and you also said you, each, week, each week you have new books, right? And I would now like to ask you this question by... Uh, well, it might come later, <laughs> but the, the next one is from Kindle Book Quotes, and it's, what are your hobbies and other things you do besides book thinkers? 
I do a few things. Uh, the, the number one that I love to talk about and really what most people actually use as my number one identifier is travel. I love to travel internationally. And so prior to COVID, um, traveling and putting myself in uncomfortable situations and new cultures and languages that I don't understand, like, I love that. And so in 2019, in January and February, I spent about five weeks in Buenos Aires, Argentina by myself. I just, I don't know Spanish. No hablo español, pero estoy aprendiendo. And I just flew down and I didn't know anybody there. I just got an Airbnb by myself and I didn't know the language. And I just like, I explored and I loved it and I met new people and I went to bars by myself and I socialized and like, it was a super fun experience. And also last year I went to Medellin, Colombia. I went to Aruba. I spent some time in Lisbon, Portugal. I went to Canada. I went to Geez, I went to other places I can't even remember anymore. And so, you know, like it was just such a fun, I just love traveling internationally. Like I'm super motivated by that. So that's one hobby, you know, and then I'm also really into physical fitness. Like I love going to the gym. I love being strong. You know, I love every day I wake up as part of my morning routine and I exercise and I get some cardio in. And right now I love like exploring. I live in Boston, Massachusetts right now. And I just love exploring the area and, running or rollerblading and like fun stuff like that. And for example, now with this COVID thing, do you, well, you can travel, but what do you do? Do you just like um, exercise or go to local zones you haven't visited yet? Well, I, I, thankfully I still do get to get a little bit of travel in. Um, so I travel within the United States and It, you know, it's a little bit more accessible than the news might make it out to seem. Like a couple weeks ago, I spent some time in the southeast of the U.S. and I went to Charleston, South Carolina and Savannah, Georgia, Jacksonville and St. Augustine, Florida. And so, you know, I, I flew down and rented a car with my girlfriend and we traveled a lot down there. And so that was a lot of fun. And uh, I also get to travel by car up here in the Northeast a lot and visit new areas and monuments. And there's a lot of history in the, you know, the Northeast in the United States. So getting to experience some of that. And I'm actually um, spending 10 weeks in Austin, Texas, which is in a very different part of the United States. And I'm driving down and driving back up and taking two different, you know, uh, two different paths. And so you know, getting to experience probably like 10 new cities later this year. So I still get to get a little bit of travel and even, even though COVID's here, but I practice my social distancing and make sure that I'm safe and, and not putting anybody else at risk. Yeah, it's a different type, right, of travel. Mm -hmm. And so the next question is from the Positive Voice official, and it is, how do you prepare to meet the one-minute book tips? Do you reread the book or the review you have already done? I just take a look at my notes in the book thinkers mobile application. I always tell people that you, you know, you can't get to your hundredth video without your first 99. And so it used to take me a very long time to prepare for videos, but here I am years later. And most of the time it only takes me one or two takes before I can get the video, you know, in one take the way that I want it and communicate the message that I just read from my phone. So it doesn't take me that much time anymore, but it definitely used to practice, practice, practice. And now you, well, last time we talked, you said that an advice you would give to anyone in Instagram is to make video content, right? And so yes. the next question is from Ricky Lorenzo and it is based on your experience, uh, what tips, Or advice would you have implemented earlier in book thinkers or what tips and advice would you give to anyone starting their Instagram well I would I would you know first off love Ricky thank you for the question Ricky he always asks me good questions too um, you know my advice to me as far as book thinkers like I just wish I started creating video content earlier because I didn't for a long time and so I'm talking to my 15 year old self right now You know, make some video content, get your face behind the community. You'll develop relationships with people. It'll also help you realize that, you know, to stop fearing the judgment of other people. Like, you know, people are, are supportive if they become part of your community and then have empathy for people that don't support you. 
You know, that's a representation of them, not you, if they make negative comments. And so I, I dealt with a lot of those insecurities up front, and I wish I just started creating video content earlier because it helped accelerate the growth of my brand and my business. And it also helped me connect with a lot of those potential mentors. You know, for me, I'm way less likely to spend a lot of time and connect with somebody who doesn't have a face behind their Instagram unless they have a podcast or show some enthusiasm in a unique way. Um, then I am somebody who I can click on their profile and see what they're all about, listen to them talk, understand a little bit more about who they are, you know, and now I have a relationship with that person instead of just an Instagram handle. And so I just wish I started creating video content a lot earlier and I wish I pushed out more content earlier too, because I used to just post like, once or twice per week and now I post every day and it, it grows faster because of that. So would you suggest that I uh, post more about myself? Yes. <laughs> Great. So I'll think about it. <laughs> um, Your first next... video can say, hello everybody, I'm Emiliano and Nick from Book Thinkers told me that I needed to post this video <laughs> introduction. So I wanted to say I'm 15, I'm from Mexico City and, and that's it. You know, I here are my favorite books and I'll repost it for you too. So you can get a couple more followers. Great, thank you. Well, um, the next question is from Listen for Knowledge, and it is, where do you think you would have been without reading? I'd be in a bad place. You know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, you know, I was, I'd probably be successful financially, uh, but I wouldn't be happy or fulfilled. And that's way more important to be happy and fulfilled than anything else. You know, my relationships wouldn't be as clean as they are right now because my communication wouldn't be that great. Um, financially, I probably would have bad spending habits and I'd probably own a bunch of materials that I don't need, which is something that I don't have now. I have investments. Um, and then health-wise, you know, I was, I was always focused on health for competitive reasons back in the day and playing sports and things like that. So I, I would probably still be healthy, but not as healthy. You know, I wear an aura ring and an Apple Watch because I'm all about quantified self. You know, I love the data, I love making progress, and having the data means that I can manage progress. And so, I, you know, I probably wouldn't be as healthy as I am. And so without books, uh, it'd be a scary situation. <laughs> and, uh, and this mindset you have now is because of, well, mostly because of personal development books, right? Yes, all and, of it, the whole mindset. And what, purpose do you give to personal development like does it help you well do you like personal development because it helps you to like achieve your purpose yeah it, it closes the gap between where you are today and where you could be like your potential you know so there's always a big difference between where you are today and what you could be you know and that's a result of the decisions that you made in the past and so moving forward it's always closing that gap. It's close, you know, it's unleashing your potential essentially in every area of your life. And that, that's how I view it. You know, these books are getting me closer to like, you know, my ideal self. And so when I think about myself at the end of my life, you know, they say the number one regret that people have is they didn't live a life that was true to themselves. They didn't take advantage of all of those opportunities that were right in front of them. They just let life pass them by in fear of, everybody else's judgment. And so for me, books like, they just help demystify that. They help me get closer to my truer life, like the person that I'm capable of becoming and being, you know, which is so much better than, than what I am today. And like, that's not a depressing thought for me. I know that by making progress, I'm always going to be happy and more fulfilled. And there's no like desired outcome. It's completely undefined. Again, it's more about the process of closing that gap which will always be open but that's not the point to close it it's just to keep closing it you know yeah i like that idea i like that perspective of personal book and <laughs> well you have mentioned um, many things about like growing and well beginning with an end in mind uh how you organize your your week and your day and about relationships so uh, as a personal question, I would like to know if you live like the seven habits or how do you apply to that book? It's been a very long time since I read that book. It was one of the first five books that I ever read. So I read it about five years ago. 
Um, but the one that sticks out to me is sharpen the saw and sharpening the saw for me just means you're, you're always reading, you're always educating, you're always preparing yourself for the opportunity because then when the opportunity pops up, you're ready for it. And a lot of people are reactive. They're not proactive. And so I just love being prepared. I love being ready. I love identifying opportunities because of things that I have read in the past. I love sharpening the saw. You know, and there's that example of, uh, you know, if you're given six hours to cut down a tree, spend the first four hours sharpening the saw. Otherwise, you know, you're using a dull blade and it takes you the full six hours to, to sharpen, I mean, to cut the tree rather than just two hours to cut the tree. And uh, you can exhaust yourself and, and waste time. And so for me, that, that's, what, that's my biggest takeaway. It's just like, you know, it's not relationship based. It's personal development again. Uh, but I really do love that book. So he was a really smart man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I should, I should really probably reread it. <laughs> Well, um, the next question is from Book Eyed Monster, and it says, "What is the most memorable story or tip from a book for you, and why?" I would well, say Rich, yeah. maybe. I will, oh, go ahead. Maybe, yeah, concept or anything you apply it. Maybe. Well, so the the most memorable book for me is Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and I'll give you the concept here. It's that we're all forced to play the game of money, so you might as well be good at it. It's not about being materialistic and about buying a Lamborghini. It's about knowing that in order to rid yourself of the anxiety in the morning, you need to have financial security. You need to have food on the table, water on the table, shelter over your head, and you probably at some point in your life will feel responsibility for either a partner or children or something like that. And so you want to also provide those things to those people. And like the easiest way to have that security is to earn money. And that, that helped me understand a lot about how money works and the importance of money. Like it's not a taboo subject that we should stay away from. It's very much a part of personal development and about eliminating anxiety. And so that concept that I implemented into my life of like financial literacy and education is important. It's one of the main reasons that I started reading these books. And I started with money focus, you know, and then I started to move into all other areas of my life. So I can mention, you know, that's one example. If, if you want another example, I'm happy to give another one too. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, you want <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, another tangible one would be like the purpose of a, a good morning routine. And so I just finished interviewing Hal Elrod, who wrote The Miracle Morning. And he talks about an acronym called SAVERS. There's really six things that you need to have in your morning routine in order to unleash your potential. And if you accomplish these things before your day starts, then you're much better off for a lot of different reasons. And so I applied that and my morning routine has all six of these steps. So number one is silence. And so for me, I meditate for 10 minutes every single morning. Number two is affirmations. I have my affirmations all typed out and framed, but I read them. You know, they're based on health, wealth, love, and happiness. And so I pick one that's relevant to my life. The V in savers is for visualization. And so I kind of tie that hand in hand with my meditation, but I spend time visualizing, even for a second, just my ideal day. I spend time on it. I focus on it. I bring, you know, some of the things that I'm committed to achieving in that essentialist graphic to the forefront of my mind, and that's important. The E in savers stands for exercise. So every single morning I go out and I exercise. And I exercise because, as Robin Sharma says, in the 5 a.m. club, like the endorphins from exercise can last up to 16 hours or something like that. And so by putting that at the front of your day, you get to take advantage of that boost of energy and mental clarity for the rest of your day and apply it to all the other activities that you have going on. And so that's the E. The R stands for reading. And so every single morning I read. And part of my reading um, actually goes hand in hand with the last S, which is scribing, and it stands for journaling. So every day I read The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, and then I use The Daily Stoic Journal, The Daily Stoic Journal by Ryan Holiday to journal, which is the last S in Savers, scribing. And uh, so that's another practical thing that I've implemented. And if you can bookend your days, to use a book reference, 
if you can control your morning and you can control your evening, then everything else in the middle has a higher opportunity of being successful, right? But if your morning is out of whack and it's crazy and it's, you know, just unorganized and your evening is crazy and you don't have control over it, like the chances that you're going to control the middle of your day are pretty low. You'll probably get lost in the whirlwind. And so for me, morning routines are super important. And uh, that book and applying those six things into my morning every day for the last couple of years has been really important for me. I would like to know how did you write your affirmation sheet? I hope I pronounced it well and I didn't say another. Yeah, no, you did it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for each affirmation, there's three steps. And this is right out of The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. So the first one is, and I'll, I'll, I'll read one right here. So my health category, the first step is to say, you're committed to the health, no matter what, there's no other option. And that's, you know, that's really firming the principle into your mind. That's not like, I want to be healthy. That's like, I'm committed to being healthy, no matter what, there's no other option. And that is providing a very clear definition. The second step is telling yourself why. And that's because committing to something without a reason you know, the chances that you're going to implement it and take advantage to, of it are not very high. And so for me, I say, I'm committed to health because I want to live a long, fruitful life full of travel. And I know that when I'm healthy, I'll be happier. As I said, travel is sort of my number one hobby. And I know that by being healthy, it means in the future, I can endure the long layovers, the change of time zones, the tough you know, hike up Machu Picchu. Like I know that as long as I'm healthy, I'll be able to experience that in a fun way and I'll be happier. And then the last step is to talk about the actions that you're going to take to follow through with becoming healthy or staying healthy. And so again, I'm committed to health no matter what, there is no other option. I am committed to health because I want to live a long, fruitful life full of travel. And I know that when I'm healthy, I'm happier. And then that last step, the actions. The actions I will take to achieve health are eating the right food, getting the right amount of exercise, taking the right supplements, practicing mindfulness on a daily basis, and getting the right amount of sleep. And so by making these, you know, those are the categories that I define health, by making sure that they're part of my daily affirmations, I'm sort of like as a mental checklist, making sure that I am taking those actions on a daily basis, which I am. And so that's one example, that's health. And that's how I structure my affirmation. I also have one for wealth, one for love, slash communication, and then one for happiness in general. Right, I, I like those concepts. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the next question is by Mindset Reading, and it is how do you keep motivated every day? <clears throat> how do you keep motivated every day? <laughs> my motivation comes from momentum. Again, like I, I'm not a big believer in discipline. I'm a big believer in setting up your environment. I'm not a big believer in like hoorah style motivation. I'm a big believer in, you know, creating momentum and having a purpose and just making progress on a daily basis. And so for me, that's where it comes from. It's just progress and momentum. Great. And that's what we talked about earlier, right? That you have your, well, your mission and your who is progress and exactly by progressing you feel motivated right mm -hmm. exactly right. so the next question is by self-help geek 18 and it says what is your favorite book on self-love and what do you think about the topic so for self-love i just read a book and i interviewed uh the author the mastery of self by don miguel ruiz jr And also another one is Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It by Kamal Ravikant. Those are two of my favorite books on self-love. And um, like a big takeaway from The Mastery of Self, as an example by Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., is that each time in your daily experience of life, right, whether you're out and about or you're, you know, you're watching TV or whatever the case is, if something gets you off balance emotionally, like it causes too much excitement or you know, the more common thing, like too much anger or sadness or something, you should stop and really focus on it. Because if you can solve that problem, you become a more stable, happier, fulfilled person. And so as an example, if somebody, you know, in a TV show says something that doesn't agree with your political beliefs, and that throws you off, 
like stop and really think about why, why are you letting that affect you so much? Like what belief are you holding on to? What belief have you formed an attachment to that like allows you to be vulnerable like that? Because if you can solve that problem, then you become more bulletproof and you can become more loving of yourself. You're not going to hate yourself for being a Republican if you don't like Democrats or something like that, you know, just to use a U.S. political example. Um, and so I love the idea of just like stopping and spending a lot of time in emotional disturbances. So that's, that's one example of self-love because then you're just a happier, more fulfilled person and you can love yourself more. And that's being proactive, right? I've seen the seven habits. Exactly, yep. And the, the last question is from Self Help Factory, and it says, how do you monetize book thinkers, or how would you monetize a book screen? So that's what I wanted to ask you earlier. It's a fun subject for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, book thinkers, the first way that I monetized it, I had authors pay me. Uh, in exchange for picture posts and video reviews. And so, you know, that came for me a little bit late in the process. I didn't understand the game. Nobody told me about it. But one day I had an author offer to pay me money and I accepted it. And I was like, wow, I just got paid to read. Like, that's fantastic. You know, so that's, that's I think, the, the first step for a lot of people. Affiliate links are okay, but it's hard to make a lot of money on affiliate links. Like Amazon will only pay you a couple cents for every book that you, that you sell through a link or something like that. Whereas an author might pay you hundreds of us dollars for a book review. And so, you know, the larger you get, the more value you provide because you have a larger audience and the more you can get paid, you know, then book thinkers for us, like we put out an e-commerce store where we sell reading related apparel and things like that. And so we make money there. Um, also we have the mobile application, which is a, subscription based application where you need to pay money to use it. And so we make money there. And my, my biggest lesson in general um, is just that when you have an audience and you listen to the audience and you engage with the audience, you'll identify opportunities to solve a problem. And as long as you're solving a problem and providing value, you can make money. And so if your audience is authors, you're providing value by talking about their book and they're compensating you for it. If your audience is readers and they're having an issue retaining and implementing information from the books they love and you provide an app that solves that problem, you're providing value and you're receiving money in exchange for it. And so, you know, just always be aware of what problems you can solve and who your audience is and then provide the solution and you can get compensated for it. And how much would you charge for a review in a account? like with 1,000 followers or 5,000 followers? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, because I, I started charging around 10,000 followers. You know, for me, I always had options. And so if an author said, how much do you charge for a review? I'd give them a couple options. I'd say, this is how much I charge for an unboxing story. This is how much I charge for one picture post. This is how much I charge for a video review. And... Uh, you know, I did stop doing those, uh, the video reviews, around 40,000 followers, I think. Um, and now we're up to about 90. But when I stopped, I was doing $650 US dollars for each video review. And like, that's, that's a lot of money uh, to get paid to read these books, you know, and to talk about them. And that included a picture post and a couple story posts and things like that. So develop a little option sheet for those authors and uh, just trial different prices until you find your sweet spot. Um, to give you a number though, I mean, I think at a thousand followers to 5,000 followers, like depending on where you are within that threshold, um, maybe at the top end of it, 50 bucks uh, to post like a little picture or video or something like that. I don't know. Okay. It all really depends on what you're doing for them, how often you're posting, how many times you're posting. You know, if the author is made of money or if this is their first book and they're trying to make a profit, like it's also dependent on that situation. And how do you find these authors? Well, for me, 100% of them were inbound leads. So they came to me because I had an audience. And uh, in my little caption, I put DM for book promotion details or something like that. And so, yeah, a lot of them came to me. I, I never prospected. But if I was going to be prospecting, I would uh, look at accounts like me and I would message the authors that I'm posting about. I would 
go on Amazon and I would go to categories that you're interested in, you know, not just entrepreneurship, but I would go under entrepreneurship and then find an area of entrepreneurship that you're interested in. Cause now you're going to get to the smaller authors and I would find their Instagrams and I would email them and, uh, or DM them your little sheet with your pricing and just say, Hey, let me know if you're interested and you can, you can reach a lot of people like that. Great. So thank you for accepting the interview and uh, is there anything else you would like to add for the audience? No, just go out there and, and read something, you know, books don't make you dumber. They just make you smarter and they'll increase your opportunities to be successful and happy in life. And so thank you for having me on this show. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm happy to be a guest and I'm excited to uh, post about it when it's, when it's all ready to go. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for hearing until the end of this podcast. I hope you liked it. I leave the links to book thinkers pages and their app in the description of this podcast or the link in bio. If you're hearing it on Instagram again, thanks. Bye.